Good morning, Rethink Church. My name is Aaron Drew. I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and I'm so glad to see you all here. Even though I'm not really seeing you, but you are seeing me, so in a way, I'm basically seeing you. So, good to see all of you. <laughs> if you're new here at the church, I would, we would love to connect with you and get to know you a little bit more and kind of see what's going on. If you want to text here to 219-233-2311, we'll text you and we'll get some information, get talking to you and make sure that you are getting connected with this body and so we can feel closer as a family and all that. So with that, we're going to get into worship. So if you want to worship with us, we'll do that. Welcome, Rethink Church. I want to invite you to worship with me today. And I've searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fail, never enough. Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid
Faith Church. I am Leah, and this is Phil, and we are the Hagers. I want to welcome and thank you for joining us for worship and church today, and we are going to pray for Maryville, our community. Glad you've joined us on this unique format with the challenging times that we have at hand. Uh, while preparing for today, God gave a couple of words for me for us to pray on, those being love, grace, and patience. So, Father God, I pray that with all the challenges that everyone is facing in our community, that first and foremost, we follow your command and we remember to love one another as our brother. Love one another as we would want to be loved ourselves. And in that, we should afford each other grace and patience to deal with everything from different opinions on how things should be handled and just getting through these new normals that have been placed upon us on how we function through daily life. I know that with your help and the Holy Spirit, we can get through this both individual and together. In your holy name I pray, amen. Thank you, have a great week. So you are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. here working in this place we worship you we worship you you are here touching every heart we worship you we worship you you are here darkness my god that is who you are we make a be 
stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working when Church. I just wanted to give a huge welcome to those of us who are gathering in watch parties today. Um, we're super excited to be able to worship together in a more communal sense rather than just by ourselves or with our family, but we get to engage with the, our family in the church and our church family. So that is super exciting. If you are not plugged into a watch party or if you want any more information on that, you can text WATCH to 219-233-2311 and we'll get more information to you about that and how to get plugged in. So another thing that I want to talk about is that we don't really know when, but when we do, we will communicate to all of you guys as best we can when we will be able to open up for our whole church meetings, to be able to meet in person in the building and all that stuff, and to be able to gather all together as a whole church family. Uh, we don't really know when that's going to happen or when we'll be able to communicate that to you guys, so keep your ears open, keep your eyes open be for listening for that announcement we'll be, when we will be able to come back together. So... If you call Rethink Church your home and you want to give to the mission and the vision of the church, you can do that in three different ways. First, you can give online at rethinkchurch.cc. Click on the Give tab. That way it's super, super simple. Oh my gosh, it's so simple. It's what I do, and I can be kind of dumb sometimes, so, you know, you got it. Second way you can give is you can text the number on the screen, and that'll kind of take care of all of that. And then the third way you can give is if you want to mail in a check to the church, you can put it in the church and you can mail it to us, mail it through the address on the screen, also on the screen right now. So you want to do it that way you can. Any ways that you can, we thank you so much. You guys are allowing us to kind of keep some of this stuff going and keeping us being able to be engaged as a, as a church and being able to impact our communities. <laughs> Today's scripture is Matthew 9, verses 18 through 26. As Jesus was saying this, the leader of a synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that very moment. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. 
Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. Well, hey, welcome back to Rethink. My name is Mark, I'm the pastor of our church, and it's such a great priv privilege that you would take a few moments out of your weekend to spend with us. As we walk through Matthew chapter 9 today, Mike just read for us this passage, and on one level there's this aspect of just healing and amazing stuff that goes on, but there's something underneath this level that I, that I think we need to explore a little bit more uh, and just kind of pick up on it. This, there's a reality that's going on in our culture today, and, and it's nothing new. Like, it, like if you look throughout history, uh, of the church, there's been this tension, and it's just we have this 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 issue in our own generation right now, and it's just, here's the tension that I have, and I don't think it's a problem to solve. I think it's a tension to manage that <clears throat> that we don't want our church and our faith to be so irrelevant and just like like shallow in a sense, but at the same time, do we want it to be full of academic and, and deep deep stuff? Probably not. The tension I have is this: as a pastor, I've watched this. This kind of get played out over the last 19 years or so. And, uh, and I've noticed it started with student ministries and it just kind of like bled into other aspects of ministry as well. And it's this, that, that right now our attention span as humans is actually less than that of a, of a goldfish. That, that we will give up on trying to have a website load up if it, if it takes longer than five seconds. Think about that. Like in the 90s when dial-up happened, uh, I remember the chime of dial-up, and I remember it would take several more seconds than five seconds. It was just like, it just felt like minutes and sometimes hours of just loading up a website. <coughs> and here we have this culture of people who are like, it didn't happen right away, I'm done. Like, like why didn't it just instantaneously happen? And there's another aspect of this, this tension that I was talking about, is that as we, as we step into this, it, it, following Jesus and just life in general, that, that there's some depth to it that comes with patience. And a process and and we miss out on this so much and and i've had colleagues and friends who classmates who've gone through the same classes that i went through at the same university i went through and after a year or so of being a pastor or going into like their next step into the ministry they just walked away from faith they, they literally just kind of walked away from it all and as i've talked to them they they say here's the, the phrase that they say over and over again my faith was found to be lacking or shallow or, or just without depth to it. And some of them have said this, like, like it just didn't fe seem fulfilling anymore. As a pastor, I've heard this phrase over and over and over again. We're, we're going somewhere else because we're not getting fed. And I would, and I would say to them, like, I, I, for a while I was a little timid about it. And now I just kind of push in on them. Um, <clears throat> and it's not because I don't care, but I just want them to think through what they actually just said. Say so I have two teenage boys, a 14 and a 17-year-old son. And if my sons were coming, ever came to me and said, hey, uh, you just don't feed me enough. Here's the questions I would ask them. Do you have food in the refrigerator that you could eat? Yep. Do you have the ability to cook? Okay. Do you have a safe place to, to do it in? Yep. Okay. Do you have all the utensils? Do you have the plate? Do we, like majority of the time, Heather, my wife and I, we make the food for you, right? Yep. Uh, so you, wanna, you want me to cut it up into bite-sized little things, put the salt and the pepper and the ketchup that you want, like in the ranch dressing, like our sons are in this... Like, they put ketchup and ranch on random stuff. Whatever. We want their own stuff, too, right? It doesn't really matter. And you want me to put it on your little forky and then land it into the airplane like that. Like, like how weird would that be if I had to do that for my 17 and my 14-year-old son who have all the ability in the world to do that? And so I've looked at people who've said this to me before as a pastor and said, so you want me to do that to you as a teenager in the faith, as an adult in the faith? You want me to piece this up for you and, like, fly it in like a little plane? Think about how weird this is. You know what I mean? And I don't mean to be rude. It's just this. That I think what really is happening is this. That, that, that there's a lack of maturity. Not because of too much doctrine or dogma. But it's actually the, the opposite. Like we as a, as a church, we have this, this lack of it. And as a, as a culture, we expect things just to be so instantaneously and almost entertainment. And not that church should be boring, not that it should be like so strict that, you know, you come in very sterile. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. <clears throat> but there should be some depth to it. And I think our faith and following Jesus and all that, it, it can get to this point where it's just like, well, is it self-help or is it actually following Jesus? Like, 
Like, is there this, this depth to it? And so today, we're going to take some moments. We're going to peel back this layer a little bit more of this passage that Matt, Mike just read to us out of Matthew. And here's this, this foundational thing that, that Matthew is continually driving into us. And it's this, this doctrinal issue that we just continually see laced through throughout Matthew. Up to this point, we've seen Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is teaching the ethics of the kingdom. And if we thought our standard was here of like how, what a good person is and how he may be made right with God, like Jesus demonstrates and he teaches it again, like, hey, no, no, this is your standard. Well, here's my standard for the kingdom of heaven. It's higher than you can even imagine. And immediately he comes down and he starts demonstrating the ethics of the kingdom. What does it look like to be part of the kingdom of heaven? And immediately this leper comes to him and, he, and, and Jesus demonstrates the compassion. And then there's something fascinating takes place. Where Jesus, like his holiness, absorbs the, the man's illness and disease. And he's made right with God, right imme like immediately after that. He's, his, his brokenness and his illness is, is removed. And he's made right and whole. Jesus then demonstrates that, hey, if you want to be made right with God, it's not about the lineage, it's not about the ethnicity, it's not about the race or, or family line or anything like that. It's all about how you, how you exercise faith. And so what he's showing us is the people that we thought were going to be out are in, the people that we thought are in are going to be out. And so it's all based on faith. And it's not about the ideas. It's not about anything like that. It's like, how do you live into the idea of faith? And, and once again, biblical faith is not just the essay and the resume of your beliefs, but it, it leads to action. That's something fascinating about biblical faith. Jesus then demonstrates his power and his authority over the like over sins and, and over the storms and he has his authority over demons and what is jesus continually doing like what is matthew trying to prove to us and just communicate to us as jesus does all this it can get traced all the way to the very beginning of his gospel of matthew and <clears throat> the gospel according to matthew chapter one it says this that that Joseph realizes that Mary is now pregnant, the, the earthly parents of Jesus. This is what we celebrate at Christmas all the time. And, and when he recognizes that his fiance, which is a little bit more than our like engagement, it's a little bit more legal in, in, in that reality, uh, is now pregnant, he is going to divorce her quietly. He's like, there's no way I could deal with any of this. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and appears to Joseph and he says, hey, hey, pause. Like this thing that Mary is like pregnant is not because of her wrongdoing. It's actually from God. And he says this, he's like, hey, like this child's going to be born and you're going to give him the name Emmanuel. And in that, what he's doing is he's quoting, hey, like the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah that 700 years before Jesus came to this earth prophesied this and said, hey, the virgin's going to give birth and you give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this foundational issue of incarnation of God being with us is what we want to explore today. What Matthew is just tied together all the way up to this point in Matthew chapter 9 is what does it look like for God to be with us? And it's found in the person of Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is not somebody like God. He's not somebody who has a part aspect of God. No, no. He is God with us. And what do we see Jesus continually doing in the gospel? And that's what it looks like for us to realize what incarnation really is. Incarnation, there's so many different levels to it. Uh, one of the levels is this, that he, he, he can identify with the, the aspects of humanity. He can, he can walk through the issues. And what does Jesus endure? What does Jesus go through on this earth? He, he's born into a stable. <clears throat> and then a couple years later, Herod the Great murders every single two-year-old boy in the Bethlehem region. Why? Because he was threatened by some toddler king who was born king of the Jews. And so after that, he kind of imagined the, the, the weight of bearing that for, for Jesus. And then he goes to a country of Egypt as a refugee. And after that, he goes into Nazareth where he lives. And people look down upon him because he lives in Nazareth. One of his own disciples as an adult will say this phrase, Nazareth, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Seriously, like, like he's learning how to deal with the, the issues of humanity, where humanity itself is going to, like, exposes and exploits his fellow humans. There's, there's issues of jealousy. There's issues of oppression. He's living under a tyrannical governor, government of, of Rome. And what does he do? He just continually leans into this process. Out of any human being, 
Jesus has the ability and probably deserves the right to, to isolate himself and to wait for, like, God figure this mess out. Like, I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> but Jesus doesn't. And what he does, though, is he takes the next level of incarnation. He participates in it. Now, here's what I mean by participate. He's not adding to the chaos and the brokenness and the suffering of the world, but he's not avoiding it. He steps into the crowds. He has this, this kingdom rhythm where he goes up, in, and out. And up, he, he spends time with, with the Heavenly Father. He connects with, the, with, with God himself to, and by disconnecting with the world, the silence and solitude. And then he goes and he spends time with, the earth, with his disciples, his, his spiritual family. And then he goes out, and he's always in the crowds, it seems. Like we see this over and over and over again, that he's in the crowds, he's in the midst of people. He, he, he embraces and he, he leans into the brokenness and the suffering of other humans. And in this... He, he sees what's really going on. He's not bubbled away, like hiding in a little bubble somewhere. He's not, he, no, he's leaning in. And he's pressing forward as this takes place. And this is what he finds himself doing in Matthew chapter 9. He's teaching about the wineskins and the patches and the shirts and stuff like that. And the synagogue ruler comes rushing to him. And he needs something so desperately. And here's what he says. Jesus, I need you to come and heal my, my daughter. My daughter is dead. The synagogue rulers and Jesus do not have a great track record. They hardly ever see eye to eye with each other. But here's Jesus teaching. And, 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 and here's what I see in our incarnation. The incarnation allows for interruptions. Like, we may have an idea of how our day should go, but when we are incarnate, when we follow with this, this pattern that Jesus lives in and models for us, that, that we, we can identify the issues of our culture and the community, we participate in our communities and, and cultures and stuff like that, then all of a sudden we have to allow for margins of interruption. Like that's just part of the process. And the synagogue ruler comes and he needs something from Jesus, right? Like he, the synagogue ruler has an imperfect faith. Think about this. Everything that Jesus has just done and everything that, that is not recorded, the synagogue ruler has been like an eyewitness of essentially, other than the stuff that happened outside of the area. But he, he would have seen or at least heard of the, the paralytic who got healed and the leper who got cleansed and healed. He would, have ta he would have heard about Jesus calming the storm. He would have heard about Jesus pro like providing this miraculous catch for, for, uh, for Peter and Andrew. He would have like, heard about and seen about like, the paralytic who got healed and the conversation with other Pharisees because of his position as a synagogue ruler. <clears throat> and does that synagogue ruler go to Jesus before that and say, I just want to be a follower of yours because you are the Messiah? No. He comes to him, he's kind of standoffish at this point, up to this point, but then he comes to Jesus out of desperation. I was having a conversation, we were doing a podcast for, uh, for the, the Rethink Church YouTube channel and the, and the podcasting stuff, and Tanisha, one of the worship leaders, said this, like, like, it doesn't really matter how you get to Jesus, like, just putting your faith into Jesus is a huge step. And that's so true, right? Like, I don't know, like, the synagogue ruler is not the only person who's ever had imperfect faith. Like, he doesn't see Jesus as the treasure. He sees Jesus as a treasure map. Like, hey, my daughter's dead and you can heal me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you. Like, almost, it's not necessarily selfish, but it is like, hey, I've got an agenda, right? And Jesus allows for this. And he gets up and he walks towards the house. And as he's walking toward the house, another interruption. It's like an interruption within an interruption. And here's what happens. This lady who's been subject to bleeding for 12 years reaches out and touches one of Jesus' garments. And Jesus, according to Luke chapter 8, this is the other uh, vantage point of the same event, <clears throat> says this, like, who touched me? And Peter is like, whoa, like, everybody is touching you. Like, they're not practicing social distancing. They're not doing anything like that. They just recognize that, hey, there's this issue pressing in on him. And Jesus is like, no, no, seriously, somebody just touched me? The power has left. And so here's what's going on here. Peter's like, okay, well, everyone's pressing in on you. I don't know what you want me to do or whatever. But this lady then comes forward and confesses, hey, it was me. And what she actually did is she reached out. This is a prayer shawl that, that almost every Jewish person, Jewish man would have worn. Now, this is a, uh, it's a rounded garment, but it has some corners. And, and what, she, what the lady actually did was something very specific. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 says this. It's a prophecy a couple hundred years before Jesus, a few hundred years before Jesus, actually. It says this. The son of righteousness will have healing in his wings. Another translation says in his rays. What does that mean? Well, the Hebrew, it says this, that the son of righteousness will have healing in his kanafs 
What does that mean? Well, this is a kanaf. This is a corner of the prayer shawl. This is the tzitzi, the, the tassels, and this is the corner. And so Jesus would have been wearing this. The people of his day just simply did. Orthodox Jews still wear these today. And she, the lady, reaches out and grabs the kanaf. And immediately the power is sent out. She's acting on faith. That Malachi chapter 4 is true. And that Jesus is the son of righteousness. And that he, there is healing in his, in his wings, in his kanaf. And so what does she do? She reaches out and, and she tells the story. And there's something fascinating that goes on here. That I can almost guarantee you that she thought that this was going to be a private event, a private issue. By, by law, she's actually living in sin. Like she's, she's unclean and she's supposed to be isolated. And for 12 years, she's lived like this. She's not been able to go to the temple or synagogue. She's not been able to go to any of the festivals or family reunions or family deal meals or anything like that. She's had to stay in isolation for 12 years. Luke tells us this, <clears throat> that she has spent all of her money on doctors, and the doctors have only made it worse. And she, once again, just has this act of desperation, and she lives into faith. And Jesus, Jesus looks at her <coughs> and says this, your faith has healed you. Now, is Jesus asking for her resume and her essay of like what are her beliefs and mental capacities and stuff like that? No. It's this, like, like you thought something and then you acted on it. Like that is faith, Jesus. That's biblical faith. Biblical faith always leads to action. And he says this, like your faith has healed you, daughter. See, this, this other lay of, trans, uh, of, of incarnation is transformation. And transformation is not just changing your circumstances, but it's the allowing God to do like, what he's doing in you is going to flow and work through you. And it's, it's a simple thing that takes place. Uh, like, she does not announce, hey, I'm a bleeding woman of 12 years and I'm going to reach out and touch you. And then and they document that, right? No, it takes place. And then, and then the disciples or somebody had to have asked these questions, like, hey, why'd you reach out and touch him? Like, what, what happened? And she tells her story, right? And her story is simply this. I was bleeding for 12 years. I saw Jesus. I reached out and touched him, and he healed me, and now I left healed. Immediately, the scriptures say that she left, like, healed. And this is the process of transformation. That, that what Jesus does in us is, is it, yes, it's a private issue, but Jesus wants us to tell our stories. So that transformation can take place. And it's not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the community that we're a part of. This is so crucial to following Jesus. And I guarantee you, she was trying to be discreet. And she was trying to do this secretively. And Jesus calls her out for it. And then they discover her story. See, this is why it's so crucial for us to tell our stories. Here in the next coming weeks, we're going to hear stories about what did God do in the 40 days of prayer and fasting that our church has been going through. And that we just came out of. Like, like, how did God show up? And this is so crucial because how God shows up for some of us is different. But we need the encouragement of other people. And this is what it's all really about. And so Jesus, they, they leave. They go to the, the synagogue ruler's house. And uh, there's a crowd of people mocking him. And, and as he walks in, he kind of ignores him. He's like, yeah, whatever. And he walks right up to them. And, and what he happens is he just walks in. And he's like, like, hey, she's not dead. She's asleep. Now, there's something fascinating about this. Like, Paul and other biblical authors will talk about how people have died, but he re they refer to them as they've fallen asleep. The early church, our, our, ancient, our ancestors in the faith, uh, whenever they would be on someone's deathbed or <coughs> if they're facing persecution, like, if you just read, the, like, the first 250 years of the church, man, our ancestors in the faith were just, was, was just so dedicated to, to following Jesus. There are emperors who literally, tore, like, they lit their gardens with Christians as being a human torch. Our, our ancestors of the faith were sent into the Colosseum for the entertainment of other people. As they were, like, literally torn apart by other, like, animals and beasts in the, in the gladiator Colosseums and stuff like that. And in this, they would never say goodbye to each other. But they would say goodnight to each other. Because here's the reality of it. They understood that death was not the end of the story. They believed that even if they physically died here, which, by the way, 100% of the humans will physically die on this earth. It's just that, that that's part of the reality of it. It's not the end of the story. That even death is temporary. 
that you can follow Jesus. And if, if you follow Jesus, you, you die, you'll wake up, and you'll be in heaven with Jesus. And this is what our earth, like, this is what Jesus is hinting at. This is what the early church leaders were talking about. This is what our ancestors in the faith are talking about. Like, in saying goodbye, it's like, hey, that's final, but saying goodnight, that's the, that's the temporary thing. And Jesus walks in, he, he's like, man, she's just asleep. And he walks into the room, he heals her, lays her hand, his hand on her. She wakes up, she comes back to life, they give him something to eat. And what is Jesus doing here? He's not just filling space to get to the cross. He's not buying time to get to the cross. What he's doing here is he's giving us glimpses of what does the kingdom of heaven look like over and over and over again. He's also fulfilling Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 talks about this, uh, that, that there, like all the brokenness and all the suffering and all the iniquities will be put onto the suffering servant, Jesus. And he will absorb it. And it doesn't just happen all at the cross. And these small little segments of, of, of individualized miracles and dealing with people like this, he's absorbing the brokenness. He's absorbing the suffering. He's absorbing the iniquities. And he's bringing, like, they come out of that differently because of what he does. That's the act of incarnation. That's the act of, of identifying and participating and leaning into the suffering and the brokenness and then transforming. See, Jesus is in the process of transforming you and I into who he created us to be. And it doesn't happen just as we, you know, just, like, follow him. Like, if it happens as we walk through this and he absorbs our brokenness. Now, it comes at the pinnacle on the cross on Good Friday. Like, that's where the past, the present, and the future iniquities, the brokenness, the suffering literally get put on him. See, I mentioned that, G, that, that death is 100% like rate, success rate. Like It happens to every single human being, even Jesus himself. But Jesus conquers death. Jesus does not allow it to be the end of the story. The purpose of what Matthew is doing and putting all these events is, is to prove that Jesus uh, has power and also to reveal our human nature and that's going on with this. That we have iniquities. That we have brokenness. And we shouldn't deny it. Like, that's part of our story. And Jesus is not waiting for us to figure this out. He's leaning into us, right? Galatians chapter 5 says this, At the fullness of time, God sent the Son to this earth so that we would experience freedom. At the end of Jesus' time, he, he's lived for three years with, like, with the disciples. He's demonstrated the kingdom of heaven. He gets arrested. He gets crucified. He's buried his dead, his dead body is buried, but then he comes out of the, the, the tomb conquering the death. That's what we call the resurrection. Forty days goes on. He's seen by 500 people, and he looks at his disciples, and he says this. Now go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've just commanded you. And those disciples, they went. And they made disciples, and they said, go and make more disciples. And for 2,000 years, disciples making disciples is how the faith has moved like, from generation to generation. The question is now is this. Will you go and take the kingdom with you? Maybe you need to learn how to be incarnate at your workplace. Maybe you need to be incarnate in your neighborhood or on your street. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's living this, this kingdom out at your schools. That, that it's not enough just to like show up. Like, that's one aspect, right? But then all of a sudden, can you participate in what's going on around you? And then, could you eventually tell your story and partner with Jesus to transform the community that he's sending you to? I think this is how God wants to transform miracle. It's by disciples walking out and living out incarnation. Some of us, we, we hear a story like this, and we, we are just like the, the synagogue ruler and that lady. We are at the end of our ropes. We've tried everything, and we don't know how to find wholeness or healing or, or restoration. And what we need to do is just cry out to Jesus. He hears us. And what he wants to do in us, he eventually wants us to, do, to, to tell that story so he can work it through us as well. Let's pray. Father God, thanks for this day. Thanks for who you are. Jesus, thank you that you were, you were sent and you actually went. You came to this earth. And you are sending your disciples even now 
to go into our community, to transform it, and to change it into who, you, into, into the potential that you have for us. Jesus, for some of us, we're just at our end, and we have nowhere else to turn but to you. And we know that you are the perfecter of our imperfect faith. And so, Jesus, we just trust that you're in this process of living with us and, and being incarnate with us through the Holy Spirit. And you want to transform us in our communities. And Jesus, I pray that you would just do that. And that you would send us and that we would take the kingdom with us. We love you, Jesus. Genuinely pray this. Amen. Well, if you need prayer for anything, I would encourage you just to text the word prayer to 219-233-2311. We'd love to join with you in prayer and whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, and invite the Holy Spirit to come with you as well. Church, I want you to know this to be true, that God loves you, and that I love you, and as we follow him, we'll encounter the best he has to offer for us. So let's go and be the church. Have a great week. See you next week.